I mean, football is so different uh, from any other kind of business because I suppose fundamentally it's not a business. Uh, you don't look at your income and your expenditure in quite the same way. But of course what football is, is a great emotional driver. It does drive our other businesses here at Stadium MK. Um, but most importantly, it drives a community. It's about identity. It's about a place and about celebrating the place that you're in. Is running a football club part of the entertainment business, a rich man's hobby, a community asset, or all three? And what difference does it make if you're a club outside the Premier League? Here, club chairman, fans and other executives talk about the unusual nature of the football business, seen through the eyes of both a traditional club, Chesterfield, and a newer one, MK Dons. How does it compare to other businesses, such as supermarkets, for example? And what does the future look like for the business of football? You're dealing with people's emotions and passions um, in a way that uh, it's not a product really that you can take or leave. I mean, we can um, have a, you know, a fantastic day and people love us, but equally we can have a very, very disappointing day. We can lose three or four games on the trot, but people still stand by us. They come back and want to come and watch us, where perhaps with a supermarket brand, if they were disappointed three or four times with the same product, uh, they go somewhere else and uh, choose a different brand or a different product. You don't do that with football. Uh, you actually uh, keep coming back and keep uh, supporting and following the club um, as much as you can. Loyal fans provide a constant revenue stream through ticket sales. But clubs are also looking to create income from other commercial activity, such as their stadiums, sponsorship, retail outlets and even hotels. However, one of the main sources of revenue, particularly for smaller clubs, has all but disappeared. Years gone by, there used to be, there used to be called the transfer market, where clubs, certainly from higher up, used to come down, look at clubs like ourselves, look at our players, take them up to the higher level, pay a transfer fee. Those days are very far and few between because now, as we all know, the Premiership and higher league clubs go abroad and bring foreign players in, etc., etc. So you know, players at our level very rarely get transferred to the higher level. So that revenue stream has, has, has virtually dried up. The MK Dons has lost an average of about one and a half million pounds a year over the 10 years that I've been involved. In a bad year, it can hit three million pounds. Um, so it, it really is a very hard thing to keep going. Of course, some of the very much bigger clubs, they can have some very rich owners that that isn't a problem for them doing. Fans are a vital source of revenue to football clubs. In the 2012 to 2013 season, across the three divisions of the Football League, aggregate attendances remained above 15 million for the 10th consecutive season, demonstrating the passion and loyalty of fans throughout the game. But in reality, how much influence do they have over the business decisions that their club makes? I think when it comes to decisions about football matters, a club can't really take any notice of the fans. Uh, fans will have their favourites when it comes to players, will have their favourites when it comes to formations, uh, but there's no place for sentimentality in, in football. Ticket prices, we know we need a lot of younger fans and I think we can influence the club and in saying if you want them then price the tickets to the price they can afford. I think off the pitch, uh, if decisions are being made, whether that is how we sell tickets, where ticket prices, you would hope then that the club would have regard to its customers. And I think uh, at a football club, talking to those customers, uh, albeit that they are something of a captive audience, I think does make a difference when it comes to keeping them on board. When there are a number of clubs in close proximity, they are each fiercely competing for people who love watching football live in a stadium. In a conventional market, one geographical area or city would struggle to sustain multiple businesses offering almost identical products and often with very similar names. And the football business is no different. We're on the outskirts of Sheffield, 10 miles away from Bramall Lane and probably 15 miles away from, from Hillsborough. And then the opposite direction, we've got Derby and Forest not too far away from us. But we're a town of about uh, 80, 90,000 people. And, um, you know, some do go and watch those particular clubs on a Saturday afternoon, we know that. Uh, but, um, you know, so we have to fight for our... Um, five, six thousand people every week <clears throat> that support Chesterfield. Winning promotion, especially to the Premier League, is now the holy grail of football. But success can cost a fortune, especially as players' wages continue to rise, even in the lower leagues. For example, in the 2011 to 2012 season, League One's clubs, on average, spent 93% of their revenue on players' wages. 
One increasingly valuable source of income is money from television rights, the impact of which is seen both on and off the pitch. The wages have absolutely rocketed due to the uh, revenue coming in from broadcasting. Um, the standard of football in the Premier League has risen beyond anything that's been seen in the past. For the, um, throughout football, it's not been as great. Uh, for clubs like ourselves in League Two currently, um, we get around £300,000 a year from it. A Premiership football club will this season pick up nearly £105 million from broadcasting revenues. Uh, we will pick up about £350,000 in League One from broadcasting revenues. That's the difference. Niall Sloan was editor of BBC's Match of the Day for many years and now runs ITV Sport. He has no doubt about what the future holds. I can only see the rights going up and up and up. BT and Sky will still be in, 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 uh, in, in position. Who knows whether the Googles, etc., or YouTube, whatever, will get their act together and they'll start bidding. Um, I cannot see anything other than the continuation of this because at the, we, we thought, you know, two deals ago it can't get any higher, and it just has. So it's an extraordinary thing, but, you know, it keeps going. But with the development of digital technology, will social media platforms have the confidence and deep enough pockets to enter the marketplace? I know people have been looking at a kind of Facebook for, for football where you would, you would view, your, your, um, you would view your, your Premier League match within that context. So the man in Soweto can talk to the man in, in Stockholm, the man in Stockholm talks to, to the man in, in Sydney. And it's a global conversation going on in that space. A few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to watch a live football match on our telephones or mobile phones. We can now, and we can consume it on tablets. And I think uh, that's going to be something which maybe clubs that are not at the top tier will look to see how they can actually develop their product uh, and monetize that to try and generate extra revenue. Football has become a global network, with English football watched all around the world. In time, that may also generate some benefits for clubs like MK Dons and Chesterfield. But has the globalisation of the football business reached saturation point? I don't think it has, because if you look at the number of territories, the number of key territories around the world, it hasn't quite cracked it. Has it worked in India? Not yet. Is it working in China? To a small degree. North America, the United States? Maybe. Until you get college kids desperate to have a career in soccer, I don't think you've reached global saturation.